The peace of the Lord be with you. And good evening and welcome to everyone. Um, not, not a lot to announce tonight, just uh, as we start our uh, Advent midweek series this, this week. Uh, as you probably heard, we are going to be looking at the, the hymns, what I'm calling the hymns of Advent. Um, those are out of the Gospel of Luke. Tonight we'll be talking about the Benedictus, the song that, uh, that Zechariah sang at the birth of John the Baptist. Next week we'll be looking at the Magnificat, the song that Mary sang at the Annunciation that she would be giving birth to the Savior. And then uh, the last week will be the, we'll sing the Gloria, which is the song that the angels sing. We sing it at, at Christmas with the birth of our Lord Jesus. So um, as we ordinarily do in Advent, we will be following the, uh, the order of evening prayer as it's printed in the bulletin. And we'll start with the opening versicles, beginning on page three. Please rise.
was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. And now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Well, as I said before the service started, as we begin with meditating upon the, I'm calling the hymns of Advent this year, the Benedictus, the Magnificat, and the Gloria, tonight we start with the Benedictus. And as I start with that, if you look at the Gospel of Luke, you would find that all three of these songs are found in there. They're all found, that's where they're all found in the Bible. And you would actually notice that the Magnificat comes first, the song that Mary sings when Gabriel announces the birth of the Lord to her. And I could have done that first, but instead I chose the Benedictus first, because there's a, a way that that sort of fits with the flow of Advent, right? You have the, the glory that's at the birth of Jesus, and as you back away from that, then we will look at the Magnificat and the Annunciation of, of uh, the birth of Jesus to Mary. And then, then you have the Benedictus, which connects to, to John the Baptist. So that's kind of my, my rationale for doing that. But as I say that, to start looking at the Benedictus, what we see in the reading tonight where, we, where the selection was made, I, I started with, with the, the verse immediately before this hymn spoken by Zechariah. And as I said that, it, as I chose that, it just says that Zechariah said this, right? He looked at his son and he said this. And uh, so I think it's good to give a little bit of context to that. Context being the, the life of Zechariah himself, the life of John the Baptist's parents. If you remember the story of John the Baptist, remember that Zechariah, his, his father, and Elizabeth, his mother, were, before his birth, an old, childless couple. But they were a couple who belonged to the tribe of Levi. That meant that they were in the priesthood. Right, the, the servants who served in the temple and around it were of that tribe of Levi. And that becomes especially important because of Zechariah himself. You see, when the story of John starts, is when they cast lots where Zechariah would have the duty of serving in the temple itself. Not just around it, not just even at the altar around it, but actually in the holy place. If you Remember the construction of the temple. There's the, the main altar outside the, the, the what was the tent of meeting of the tabernacle, but is the holy place and the most holy place. And that's where the sacrifices happen morning and evening, that all the animals were sacrificed at, at that altar. But then in morning and evening they also the priests would come into that holy place and they would come to a smaller altar right in front of the curtain. And the curtain, of course, was that line between the holy place and the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. You know, the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? That's where, that's where that was, beyond that curtain. And what the priest would do is he would come and he would bring incense to that altar and the prayers of, of the, the people of Israel, he would pray them and they would ascend to the Lord like the, the smoke of the incense. Well, on that day, Zechariah was chosen to be in the temple. 
And as he was offering this prayer with the incense and, and, the, and doing all that he was supposed to do, something unusual happened. An angel appeared to him, the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and told him that he was going to have a son. Now, at Zechariah's age, and the age of Elizabeth, his wife, he was understandably a little dubious about this. But because of that doubt, he was made mute until the birth of John. Luke tells then that when the, the son was born, Zechariah wrote on a tablet that he was to be named John, and then his tongue was loosed, and he began praising and blessing God. And then the first words that we hear from Zechariah right after that are the words of the song that we have in the Benedict. So we meditate on that song tonight, and as we do so, what's it about? Well, we see that it finishes with these words about John, saying, You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So there we hear about John and his work. And the work that we hear John doing as we hear those lessons about him in Advent. We hear that he will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. And we, and we know that, right? Because we do hear it every year at this time. We hear about that, that preaching of, of John, that the kingdom of God is at hand. And there's this call to repent of that, right? We know that. We know about how he preaches that the axe is laid at the root of the tree. And there's need for that tree to keep bearing fruit consistent with repentance. Let's that tree be cut down. And what's the point of John's preaching? Well, it's that call to repentance that brings to the realization of the people that there is sin the dire consequences. And if the path of those consequences is not changed, if the final end of that sin will be hell. John doesn't solve hell, does he? And what's that do? Well, it creates the realization of sin so that when the Lord comes, he would have this straight path. That his message of salvation would be received and the knowledge of how deeply it's needed. As we as Lutherans say it, John sort of comes preaching the law and condemnation in such a way to prepare the heart for the healing of the gospel, of salvation, of forgiveness. So that's what this portion of Benedictus proclaimed to John is specifically talking about. But as we see that, what's it really, what's the rest really about? And really that part itself, what, what's it about? Is it, is it about John himself? No, really, it's about the promise of Jesus. After all, what makes John important? Is it he in his own person? No, it's the office that he bears is sort of the new Elijah, the voice in the wilderness, the voice paving the way for the Lord. So instead of John, as truly ought to always be the case, the focus is on Jesus himself. And look at how Zechariah brings all this together around him. He speaks of this in light of what? He speaks of all this in light of what was spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets from the world. What's that say? Well, it's saying that as Zechariah was blessed to be visited by the angel Gabriel in the temple, and as he witnessed the birth of his child John, that he sees that he is an eyewitness to the fulfillment of all of the promises that God had made of old. The promises he made to his people in what we call the Old Testament. And it all started with that covenant to Abraham. To remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. You recall that? That story of Abraham? And I think 
Zechariah probably could relate to Abraham because you see they're sort of mirror images of each other in a sense. The story of Abraham, you know, it starts with Abraham in a different place, of course. He started in the land of Ur, where he was called from, and he was brought to the land that ultimately would be the promised land, the land that the, the Jews, the Israelites, would enter into after they were called out of Egypt and lived in the wilderness. And that land that they were led into by Joshua as they went through the waters of the Jordan after the death of Moses. So that's where, where Abraham was. The Lord was promising him that this land would be given to them centuries before it was. But in the midst of that, the Lord made another promise to Abraham. He promised that there would be this blessing from Abraham to the whole world. He promised that through Abraham's offspring, the nations of the world would be blessed. And that Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And in Genesis 15, you see that covenant, that promise, enacted. What the Lord did is He told Abraham to bring a ram, or a heifer, a goat, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And He told him to cut the, the larger animals, the ram, the heifer, and the goat, and the whole goat in half. And He placed them on the ground. You see, what He was doing was creating that covenant. This was common with the covenant that He would cut animals. In fact, in Hebrew, the word wouldn't be to make a covenant, it would literally be to cut a covenant. These animals would be cut in half and the, the people would walk in between those cut halves so as to say, this is what will happen to me if I break this. So Abraham did what he was told and after he did, the Lord put him into a deep sleep. And when he awoke, he saw a, a, smoke pot, a smoking fire pot and a torch passing between the animals. You see, that was God himself promising to fulfill the covenant. Abraham didn't do anything. It was God's promise. The Lord was vowing that promise to Abraham that his offspring would bless the whole world. Now, if you know the story of Abraham, you know he got antsy about that offspring coming. That's where Ishmael comes from. They were, he and, and uh, Sarah were waiting for the birth of that child and it didn't happen, it didn't happen. They finally ran out of patience for it, and Sarah told Abraham to sleep with Hagar, the servant. But that wasn't the fulfillment of it. But eventually Isaac was born. Born when Sarah, Abraham's wife, was too old. And that's why I say that there's this mirror between Zechariah and Abraham, because here Zechariah is. He and Elizabeth are too old to have kids. But in order to fulfill what the Lord has promised, he works these miracles. And in the case of Zechariah, he's doing this as a part of the fulfillment of this covenant. But again, what was the goal of the covenant? Was the, the goal of the covenant John himself? I'm assuming you all know it's not. The goal of the covenant is Jesus. And look at how he words it here. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers. It's here that we see the beauty of the fulfillment of that song, isn't it? This covenant, promise, cut with Abraham is fulfilled. It's fulfilled in the coming visitation of the Lord. He's coming in the flesh of this Jesus. He's visiting His people in the body of this Emmanuel, God with us. That took a long time for that promise to be fulfilled, about 2,500 years, which for us as people seems like a whole long time. But it's happening. The covenant is being fulfilled. And God is visiting His people there in a way even beyond how he visited Abraham. He's visiting them and, and he's doing so by, by raising up a, a horn of salvation. You have to understand a horn is a, is a, power, a symbol of power. Right? There is God coming in all of his power. And coming to do what? To bring that salvation, to save us from our enemies, to save us from the hand of those who hate us. To show mercy, promise to our fathers. 
The whole power of God. The God who created the universe used to work to save his people. And what will be accomplished in this? To grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Zechariah tells John that he will come to give knowledge of salvation and the forgiveness of sins. As his power works all of this for the rescue, that's exactly what it is. It is the rescue of forgiveness. It takes the people out of their sin. It takes them out of the power of the evil one, the, the devil who would seek to destroy them. It enlivens them out of the slavery, the darkness, the, the grief, and the, the suffering the death brings. And it gives life. That salvation gives righteousness, holiness to these people. That they can stand before God and not fear that their actions are still tainted by their own sinfulness. And Christians, that's what this means for you. The covenant of Abraham is fulfilled in that offspring of Abraham, his great, 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 however many greats, grandson, the one who would be born of the virgin, in whom all of that power will be laid in the manger. It was all for you. It was all for you that the covenant in the blood of this Lamb of God would be poured out on the altar of the cross, that you would be blessed on him. Zechariah's son, John, got to be a big part of the life of Jesus. He got to pave the way for him. He got to be that line between that old covenant to Abraham and the new covenant. They all was for the redemption. The redemption of all mankind. But he has brought it to you. He has baptized you in the new covenant, circumcising your heart. He has fed you with his sacrificial body, giving you his blood, the blood of that covenant drink. And so you are made a new one again. You, Christian, are rescued from sin and death and the devil. Your enemies who hate you. You are rescued from the darkness of this world. You are given life and you are holy in Him to serve Him without fear. To serve Him without the fear that you will be cast out of His presence in the hell. To serve without fear that your lacking is too much. Without fear that the, the things, the secrets that he knows about you, your life, your thoughts, your words, without fear that any of that is greater than his power of redemption. Yes, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our way of peace, or our feet into the way of peace. Because of that, we live in the light of Christ. And those words of Zechariah spoken to John are fulfilled in the middle of This God who is so attentive to fulfill his promises, promised to you in your baptism, promises to you in his word, promises to you in his covenant, covenantal meal, that all of this is true for you. What a blessed him that we have then as we look forward to celebrating the birth of this fulfillment. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Please rise and we continue by singing the magnet pop on page six and four.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew, our Senate President, Alan, our District President, for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the Church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For Joseph, for all public servants, for the government, and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people who are present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Hallelujah. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. Jesus, Lord. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. That by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. We live in the reign of the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commands, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God, by our Lord, and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. We continue with our closing hymn in 361 of the Little Town of Bethlehem. 